Hello, welcome to this Bible teaching provided to you by First Baptist Church in Cameron, Missouri. My name is Pastor Terry and it is my privilege to spend a few minutes today with you opening God's Word as we continue and actually conclude a, a unit of six lessons uh, which is in, entitled Living with Hope in a Broken World. And so uh, I invite you to take your Bible as we will be turning again uh, for this sixth lesson in this unit to 1 Peter. And so I invite you to take your Bible and as we begin we'll just uh, kind of do a quick review of where we've been over the last five weeks. If you have missed one of these lessons I encourage you to go back and, and uh, find my YouTube channel and you can catch up and we'll talk more about that at the conclusion of today's lesson. But uh, this unit, Living with Hope in a Broken World, being mindful that in the Bible, hope doesn't mean wish. It's, it's not a wishful thinking, but hope refers to a confidence that we can have because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So uh, when we started this unit, the first lesson was entitled, The Basis for Our Hope. And that lesson came from 1 Peter chapter 1. Verses 1 through 9. In verse 3 it says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we recognize that the basis of our hope is not in anything that we have done or in anything that we can do. But the basis for our hope is, is solely in what Christ has already done for us. The grace and the mercy that has been extended to us by our Father and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, for through his victory over the grave, that is the basis for our hope. In week two, we looked at the expression of our hope. Again, and this was from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25, where verse 13 begins, Gird your minds for action. And verse 14 continues, As obedient children do not be conformed, but instead, verse 15 reads, Be holy in all your behavior. So we recognize that our hope, our confidence that is through Christ, the basis of our hope, is to be expressed in a certain way. And that, is, that expression is through action. That expression is through obedience. That expression is by living a life of holiness in all of our attitudes, our actions, our behaviors. The expression of our hope. In week three, we talked of the testimony of our hope from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 15. Verse 5 in that passage refers to Christ's followers as being living stones, being built up into a spiritual house for a royal priesthood. Continuing in verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have hope. And our hope is for a purpose. It is for the purpose of testifying as to the source of our hope, for the expression of our hope in the way that we live. Week 4, we spoke of the endurance of our hope. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 17. Verse 14 in chapter 3 reminds us that even if we should suffer for the sake of righteousness, we are blessed. Verse 17 it says, If it is better that you suffer for doing right, rather than for doing what is wrong. Our hope allows us to endure even the sufferings of this world, recognizing that if our Lord, Jesus Christ, if He suffered, which He did, then He told us that we too should expect that suffering. In fact, that suffering, that persecution, is a blessing. Which led us to last week's lesson, verse five, uh, unit lesson number five, uh, the joy arising from our hope. Uh, for this, we went to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and verses 12 through 19. In verse 13, it said, To the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, 
you may rejoice with exultation. So we recognize that we are going to suffer, and even through that suffering, we can have joy. But it's not something that we can manufacture in and of ourselves, but it's something that God gives us. He gives us a joy through the Spirit, and, and that really leads us into week six as we think about uh, the source of our joy and how we can have our eyes fixed on what is coming for us. Uh, the life that we have after this life. And that realization should give us a joy. So today in week six, we'll be talking about the culmination of our hope. And for this, we'll be turning to 1 Peter chapter 5. And we'll be looking at verses 5b, the second part of verse 5 through verse 11. And again, this entire unit of six lessons has been taken out of the book of 1 Peter. I always enjoy when we have a unit uh, that spends its entirety in one book of the Bible because you can really get a good picture of what that author is, is speaking of and how God has used uh, that man to pen his words, whether it be to a person or whether it be to a church. And so uh, the culmination of our hope, the main point from our lesson today is that what we hope for in Christ will one day be fully attained. And recognizing that hope, that affirmation, that confidence, that one day my faith is going to become sight. And because of that, I can have joy in the circumstances of life. I can endure the sufferings of this world. I can live a testimony and that, that reflects and brings honor and glory to Him. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we begin this lesson today, we thank You for the hope that we have. We thank You for Your Word, which You allow, that You uh, use to sharpen us and to correct us, uh, to uh, continue to, to make us into the men and women that You desire for us to be. Lord, I do pray that we would be cognizant of the basis of our hope, the expression of our hope, the testimony of our hope, the endurance of our hope, and the joy and the culmination of our hope. We thank you, Father, for that hope, for that confidence that we have to live this life with our eyes on another place, recognizing that we have hope and confidence through the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. As we begin our, our study today, let me start with this question. When has a destination been worth the journey? When has a destination been worth the journey? As I think about that question, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is when we choose to take a trip. Uh, we recognize that travel is not always easy, whether we're driving, whether we're taking a train, whether we're flying, whether we're going on a cruise. There's a lot of planning that takes place. There's a lot of cost. Uh, there's a lot of miles that have to be traveled before we get to that destination because usually it's not the, the traveling that we're looking forward to. It's the fact that we've arrived. We've gotten to that place. And so when I think of that, I think of a trip that my wife and I took uh, at the beginning of last summer. Uh, we took a, a vacation without the kids, uh, just she and I, and we went to the Grand Tetons and to Yellowstone National Park. And we drove, and so it, it took us a, a lot of hours to get to where we were going. But when we got there, uh, how we enjoyed the beauty of those parks, the, the grandeur of the Grand Tetons, and uh, just the, the incredible sights of Yellowstone National Park and, and the size of that park and, and how it had so much to offer. We, we spent over a week between those two destinations and, uh, and really enjoyed that time. And so we, we recognized when we got there uh, that the, the things that we saw, the time that we enjoyed together, it was worth that travel. The destination was worth the journey. Maybe another time when we think about that is when we think about education. Uh, just recently uh, in our family, we've had two that have completed educational milestones. Our son, David, uh, is, has just graduated from high school, uh, while our daughter, Angelique, has just graduated with her undergrad degree from college. 
And so we recognize that to earn that degree, to get that diploma, whether it be from high school or college or graduate school or where, whatever that might be, it takes work. It takes dedication. It takes time. It takes studying. It takes perseverance. All those hours in the classroom uh, finally pay off when you walk that stage or when you receive that diploma this year, receiving that diploma in the mail because you weren't able to walk across the stage because of COVID. And yet uh, we recognize that that, that destination, that graduation has been worth the journey. Another thought that comes to my mind that I did not experience myself personally, but my wife did uh, six times, and that is childbirth. I know that going through that process, going to classes and going to doctor's visits and, and trying to eat a certain way and exercise a certain way when, when a lady is, is carrying that new life, oh, we recognize that it, that, is, that is a tough journey. And, and yet all of it is worthwhile as we see that new life brought into this world and as we see those lives grow up as we see that baby become a toddler and become a preschooler and then a child in elementary school, we see that, that toddling become walking and then running and then riding a bicycle and, and again how physically they mature to that point of becoming young men and young women. So we recognize that within childbirth that the destination is certainly worth the journey. And then lastly I think about the spiritual journey that we're on and uh, being on the pastoral staff at here at First Baptist Church I've had the opportunity in the last several years to, to baptize several uh, young men and young women who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and they wanted to testify they wanted to show that faith uh, and, and to use that as a witness by being baptized as, as we believe the Bible tells us to do and so we think about that spiritual journey that we're all on, whether that journey for you began when you were a young child, or whether it began when you were a teenager or a young adult or maybe even an older adult. We recognize that as long as we are alive, we are on a journey. We're on a spiritual journey. And today's lesson reminds us of the hope, uh, re reminds us of the culmination of that journey and how one day... Uh, we are either going to meet our Lord uh, through death or He is going to come again and He's going to take his, his church to that place that is being prepared. Author C.S. Lewis was no stranger to sufferings and the setbacks of life. He, he witnessed two world wars and the death of his young wife. And yet, in one of his greatest writings, Mere Christianity, he wrote these words. If I find in myself a desire which, is no ex which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. He went on to say, if none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it. That does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably, earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. And he finished with these words, I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. The culmination of our journey, recognizing that we were not made for this life. We were not made for this country but we continue to fix our eyes on that desire for our true country, for our true destination, which we will not find until after death. As Christ followers, we have been given eternal life in the coming kingdom of God. Therefore, we have hope. We have confidence. The trials of this life will one day give way to a life of eternal joy and peace. And so we turn to 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 5b, the second part of verse 5, and reading through verse 7. You'll see the words on the screen beside me, which is the New American Standard, but I again encourage you to open your Bible uh, so that you can see 
uh, God's Word written to you. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety upon Him, because He cares for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, 5b through 7. So Peter begins in this passage with the admonition that we as Christ followers are to clothe ourselves in a certain way. You know, we recognize that a, that a person's role is sometimes identified by the way they dress, by their clothing. So it's, it's not confusing to us as we uh, see, uh, maybe we're taking a flight and we see a pilot dressed a certain way compared to the stewardess who is dressed a certain way. In most circumstances, most situations, we would not confuse those two individuals. We would not confuse the role that they play. One is responsible to fly the plane, to get us safely to where it is that we're going, while the other, we see their role as being to take care of us as we are on that flight. You know, we, we see the way that an athlete dresses compared to the way a coach dresses. And so based on what they've put on, based on their clothing, we understand that they have a different role. One is responsible to, to be on the field and to play the game, while the other is responsible to be on the sideline and to coach, to give instruction so that the players are successful in the game that they're playing. A third example that I thought of was the difference between a doctor at a hospital and the one that may be responsible for helping to keep that hospital clean. Again, we would maybe pass these two people in the hallway and, and we probably would have no confusion as to what their role is. So likewise, we as believers, we as Christ followers, we are to be dressed, we are to be clothed, spiritually clothed, in a certain way. And, and again, we're not talking about our physical dress, but we're talking about being clothed with a certain character, being clothed with certain attitudes and actions and behaviors. The word clothe uh, in verse 5 may also be translated to dress, or your Bible may say to gird on or to put on, uh, to be closely garbed. One translation reads, it carries the idea of to put on oneself and indicates a position in which someone is secure. You know, Peter is telling us that as Christ followers, we are to, to put on humility. We are to, to be secure in that. We are, we are to, to be closely garbed in that attitude and in, in, in that trait of character. We are told to put on humility. To be humble means that we have a lowliness of mind. This humility comes not as we compare ourselves to others, but as we compare ourselves to the Lord. So as I compare myself to other people, my temptation may be to be proud, to be not to be humble. But as I compare myself to the perfection of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, then that will remind me of the lowly stature in which I should be living. You notice in verse 5 that this humility, it says, is toward one another. And yet, that humility impacts our relationship with God. Because that verse continues by saying, because God resists the proud, but has given, he gives grace to the humble. So I am to be humble toward one another. I'm to be humble within my family. I'm to be humble in my workplace. I'm to be humble in my church, in my community. But I recognize that that humility impacts my relationship with God. Because God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. So as we clothe ourselves in this humility, 
God reminds us in verse 6 of our eventual exaltation. Verse 6 says, Humble yourself so that He may exalt you. He, God, may exalt you at the proper time. As we embrace the lowliness, the meekness of who we are apart from Christ, God promises that He will lift us up in His perfect time. But until that time, we are to embrace the attitude of a lowly servant. Jesus stated these words in Matthew, or sorry, in John chapter 13, uh, beginning in verse 12. Actually, in, in this chapter, you see the, the story of, of Christ and his disciples at the, the, the Lord's Supper, at that last Passover meal. And so it says in John 13, beginning at the end of verse 12, do you know? What I have done to you? This is Jesus speaking. Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. John 13, 12 through 15. So Jesus made it very clear that he took the position of humility. He took the position of the lowest slave in the house when those disciples entered that upper room. And while none of them offered to take up the basin and the water and the towel to wash each other's feet, Jesus took that position and he washed the dirty feet of his disciples. If Jesus, as Lord, as Savior, as teacher, if he was willing to serve, should we not do the same? One of the things I remember about my grandmother, on my mom's side, we would go see uh, grandparents two weeks out of the year because we lived several hundred miles away. And my mamma graves, uh, one thing I will always remember about her is that she was the one that would fix the meals. She would be the, the one in the kitchen preparing. But when that meal was finished, she was always, always the last one to eat and the last one to sit down. And if there was no room at the table, which many times there wasn't, she would go to another room with her plate and she would have her meal. She was a beautiful example of a servant, someone who understood uh, that they needed to place the needs of other people before their own needs. Andrew Murray was a South African writer and teacher and pastor. He said these words, Humility is perfect quietness of heart. It is for me to have no trouble, never to be fretted, or vexed, or irritated, or sore, or disappointed. It is to expect nothing, to wonder at nothing that is done to me, to feel nothing done against me. It is to be at rest when nobody praises me, and when I am blamed or despised. It is to have a blessed home in the Lord, where I can go in and shut the door and kneel to my Father, Father in secret, and be at peace, as in a deep sea of calmness, when all around me is trouble. It is the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ, redemptive work on Calvary's cross, manifested in those of His own, who are definitely subject to the Holy Spirit. Andrew Murray understood humility. He understood that the source of that humility is in what Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. How Christ lived his life as the lowest of servants. So why do you think, let me ask this question, why do you think pride is such a big deal when God examines our hearts? Why is pride the, the opposite of humility? The opposite of being humble is being proud. Why is pride such a big deal 
when God examines our hearts? Well, as I think about this question, there are four thoughts that come to my mind. First, to be humble is to be submissive to God's authority and God's control. And so, to be proud uh, causes me to not want to submit. And yet, how can I say that Christ is the Lord, the master of my life, if I refuse to submit to him? And so I, I, I think the issue of pride is, is, is an important one for us uh, as we examine, as God examines our hearts, because to be proud, to not be humble, is therefore uh, rejecting the authority and the control of God. A second thought, to be humble is to recognize God's purpose and will. When I am proud, I am fixed on what I want. I'm fixed on my own desires. But in humility, I recognize that God has a purpose for me. God has a purpose for my life. God has a purpose for my family. God has a purpose for me in the way that I work, in the way that I earn a living, the way that I'm able to use that as a platform to be a testimony. God uh, has a purpose for me. And in humility, I recognize that purpose and that will, God's will. A third thought, to be humble, is to embrace an intimate relationship with God. When I'm proud, I am putting a wall between me and God. But, but I need to come to Him in humility. And so humility opens that door of intimacy so that I can have that kind of relationship with God. And fourthly, to be humble is to accept God's provision for our debt of sin. If I'm proud, I may think that somehow I can earn my own salvation. I, so, I may somehow think that, well, if, if I'm just good enough, God will accept me. If I do enough good that, that's in, in God's scales of justice, that, that my goodness outweighs my badness, my sin, then God is going to welcome me into his family. God's going to accept, accept me into heaven, into his eternal kingdom. And yet we recognize that that's not true. That it is only through Christ that I can come to salvation with the Father. So I have to, I have to humbly accept God's provision from my debt and not in some arrogant or, or boastful way think that I can earn my salvation in and of myself. So as we humble ourselves, God welcomes us. As it says in verse 7 of 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. That's how much God loves you. He wants that relationship with you through his son Christ. He wants you to cast all your burdens, all your cares upon him. When I read that passage, I immediately thought of a praise chorus. In fact, this is a song we're going to sing here at church in a couple of weeks. And, and these are the words. I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time that I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Now, the one line in that chorus that I think we have to be careful of is the idea that, well, any time I don't know what to do, well, that's when I talk to God. It's like, well, God expects me to kind of fend for myself, and, well, if, if, I, if I get in a, in a hard place, if I find myself in a corner where I don't see a way out, well, that's when I talk to Him. That, that's when I, I, I call upon Him, and, and that's not the attitude that we should have. But I should recognize that in all times of my life, apart from Him, I don't know what to do. Because my natural inclination in the flesh is to do something completely contrary to what He desires for me. And so I recognize that I am to cast all my cares. I'm, I'm to cast all of my burdens. I'm to lay them all at His feet. Recognizing that 
I don't know what to do. But he is willing to show me his truth. He is willing to show me his path, his plan for my life. You think of the example of Christ and, and, and how he continually spent time with the Father in prayer. That when the storms of life were going on, that's when he was trying to find a place to go by himself to spend time with the Father. Was it because he was uncertain as to what to do? I, I, I don't think so. I think that the Son always understood uh, the Father's plan. And yet I think he also needed to be strengthened and encouraged that he would be faithful to follow that plan, to, to do the Father's will and not to somehow subject his own will into that. In and of myself, I never know what to do. My natural inclination may be to, to follow the flesh and my human perspective and understanding, but I must learn to cast all of my cares upon the Lord. So we are to be humble. We see that in this first section of verses. But secondly, the, the next passage reminds us that we are to be ready, that we are to be watchful, and that we are to be firm, we are to stand firm. And so for this we go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. So we see three needs of the Christ follower in these verses. First, we need to be sober-minded. We are to be of sober spirit, your translation may say. This means that we are to be self-controlled, that we are to have clear judgment. It means to have one's wits about them. Peter expressed the same thought in, in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Uh, chapter 1, verse 13, when he said, Gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. As we clothe ourselves with humility, we position our mind and our spirit to be clearly focused, to be sober-minded. Secondly, we are told that we need to be on alert. We need to stay awake. We need to be on, on the alert. We need to be on guard. We need to be watchful, be vigilant, be responsible. Jesus told his followers in Matthew 24, 42, Therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Be on the alert. Here in 1 Peter, Peter warns that, that the adversary, the devil, is looking for someone to devour. So be on the alert. As I was thinking about that, I again thought about uh, the trip that my wife and I took to the Grand Tetons and to Yellowstone. And one of the things that we were warned time and time and time again was to be on the alert, especially for bears. Because you never know when you will come upon a bear. And if that bear feels threatened, then they may become aggressive toward you. And so as we would go on hikes, sometimes it was almost difficult for me to enjoy the hike because I was so concerned about a bear being around the next bend or uh, coming from behind a tree. And, and so we, we purchased our bear spray and we read the instructions on how to use it. And, and fortunately, we never had to. We did see bears. Uh, but they were always from the security of our car, usually as we were driving through areas of the park. But we were warned, we were told, be watchful, be alert. Third, we're told that we are to be firm in your faith. Be firm in your faith. Be grounded. Paul wrote in Colossians 2, 5, that he was rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. 
the stability of your faith. And I believe that that stability wraps back into that idea of being disciplined. If we don't have discipline, we're not going to be stable. But as we are disciplined, we find that foundation, we find that stability. So be firm in your faith, be grounded. As I think about that, I think about the children's song that, that speaks of, of the wise man, and, and it's, it's a children's song based on the scripture, you know, which, which causes us to wonder, have I built my life on the sand, like the foolish man, or am I like the wise man, having built my life upon the foundation of the rock? And in both those situations, storms are going to come to both. The house that's built on the sand and the house that's built on the rock, the storms will come. And yet, which is going to stand through those storms? So be watchful. Be ready. Be firm. Recognizing that the hardships of this life will come, even as a Christ follower. I heard the comment several weeks ago that we as the church, we as Christ followers, are living in an age in which the church, Christianity, is being persecuted like never before. Like never before. In the 2,000 years of the church, never have we seen the, de the degree of persecution as what we are seeing in 2020. Consider these numbers. Every month, these are average numbers around the world every month. 359 Christians are killed for faith-related reasons. 359 brothers and sisters in Christ, if you're a Christ follower. We've lost nearly 360 brothers and sisters in Christ on average every month. Why? Because they're standing firm. They're staying in their faith, and they're losing their lives. In the last month, around the world, on average, 154 churches and Christian buildings have been burned or attacked. In the last month, around the world, 262 Christians have been detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. So when you think about, and when I think about, the degree of persecution that I face in America in 2020, it, it compares nothing to this. I do not fear for my life. I do not fear that I'm going to be thrown in prison. I do not fear that, that the church in which I serve is going to be burnt down. And yet, that is the reality of what's happening in the world around us. So how, how do we respond to that? Well, first, we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are enduring these hardships. If you are suffering for the cause of Christ, be mindful that what we hope for in Christ will one day be attained. In ancient Rome, Crowds by the tens of thousands would gather in the Colosseum to watch as Christians were torn apart by wild animals. In fact, in, in this image that you see, not only do you see the, the animals that, that are getting ready to, to prey on these believers, you also see other believers who have been nailed to a cross and other believers whose bodies have been set on fire. Viewing the ruins of such a place, a man once questioned, would I, could I die for him tonight to get this gospel to the ends of the earth? Those early Christians lived on the threshold of heaven, within a heartbeat of home, no possessions to hold them back. They had a hope. They had a confidence. And it wasn't in the things of this world. 
It wasn't even in the life that they had. But it was in that confidence, in that hope, in that future home that they knew was being prepared for them. So we're told, Christian, be humble, be ready, watchful, and stand firm. And then lastly, we must be mindful that we are, and may be even more so, in the days and months and years ahead, we are called to suffer. So we turn to verses 10 and 11, 1 Peter chapter 5. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. 1 Peter 5, verses 10 and 11. So we see in this passage four things that God will do for us as we faithfully hope in Him. Now notice that this verse begins after you have suffered for a little while. So hey, believer, don't think that this isn't coming. And, and if it doesn't come, then maybe we need to question whether we're living the kind of life that we should be living. Because we should expect those sufferings. We should expect that persecution. But after we've suffered for a little while, the God of grace who's called us to that eternal glory in Christ, these are the four things that he is going to do. Four things that God will do for us as we faithfully open him. First, he is going to restore. He is going to complete or repair to prepare for its full destination or use. To, to restore, it means to be adjusted to fully function. To be adjusted to fully function. When you feel broken or dysfunctional, rest and remember that God is going to restore you. He's going to complete you. He's going to repair you. He's going to adjust you so that you can fully function. Maybe not for what you think you're to accomplish in this world. But we are going to be fully functional for what He wants to accomplish through us. He will restore. Secondly, He will confirm. To confirm means to fix firmly, to establish, to give support and able to secure. When you feel weak and vulnerable, rest and gain confidence through the support of your Heavenly Father. He will restore. He will confirm. Thirdly, He will strengthen. To strengthen means to, to make strong so as to be mobile. Being able to move in a way that achieves something in the most effective way. We must recognize as Christ followers that God's strength, that we feel that that strength comes with a purpose. Not to be comforted, by that strength, but to be moved by His strength to do something, to be a peculiar kind of people. We will be strengthened. We will be confirmed. We will be restored. And then lastly, we see that we will be established. To establish, to be founded, to be grounded, to be firmly planted to lay a basis for that which is to follow. We are established to be a part of His eternal kingdom and to be a part of His kingdom work right now. So, Peter says, after you have suffered for a little while, be ready for God to perfect you, to confirm you, to strengthen you, and to establish you. These things are done through His power, through His dominion, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So be it. May you be empowered. May you be perfected, confirmed, strengthened, and established. So how does your hope for eternity influence your everyday life? Think about that. 
how does my hope for eternity influence my everyday life? I've had the opportunity to be around some individuals who were very firm in their faith as they were walking through their final days of life. And it was very interesting and very refreshing to see the attitude with which they approached those days. Because their hope was firmly fixed in another place. They recognized that they were just traveling through this life. And that this life was soon coming to an end. And they were ready. They were ready for that eternity. And they experienced those final days with that certainty and with that hope. So as you think about that question, think about these questions. Are you confident? Are you hopeful? Do you find that during this time of uncertainty in our, in our world, in our country, maybe in the community in which you live, do you find that you feel overwhelmed, that you're depressed, that you feel hopeless? Be confident in the hope that comes through your relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you don't have that relationship, you don't have that hope, then I ask you, pick up the phone this week. Call someone. Speak with someone. If you're not a part of a church where you can talk to a pastor, call me, Pastor Terry, First Baptist Church, Cameron, Missouri. You can uh, look it up on the internet, uh, but our phone number, 816-632-7251. Call, because you need to have confidence in the hope that you have through Jesus Christ. Is your hope rightly placed? If your hope isn't in Him, then it's in the wrong place. And if it's in the wrong place, then you're not going to have hope. You're not going to have confidence, because we see that all the things of this world, they are on that sand. They're not on the rock. And so, is your hope rightly placed? The third question, is your hope firm? Is it unshakable? If it's in Him, if you've built your life on that solid foundation, if Christ is the cornerstone of your life, then you can have that confidence. You can have that hope. Is your hope, void? Is your hope joyful? Uh, do, do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel um, a lack of, of, of peace? And, and even though we recognize that hardships do come, uh, we recognize that. But even through those hardships, we can have joy. Because those, those things that we experience in, that, in, in life don't impact our joy. They may impact our happiness, our temporary happiness, but they don't impact our joy. Is your hope enduring? Is your hope enduring? And then lastly, is your hope expressed in obedience and holiness of life? Are you living the life of hope? Are you living a life of confidence with that hope being placed in a Savior who not only wants to save you, but He wants to be your Master. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to recreate in you uh, that man or woman that He desires for you to be. And that means a change in behavior. That means a change in life. That means living a life of holiness. So throughout this entire unit, these six weeks of studying from 1 Peter, we have had this overarching theme. Because a believer's hope rests in Christ, knowing that their hope in Him cannot be shaken, they can approach the questions and challenges of life with confidence. And I just encourage you, when you find that confidence waning, Open God's Word. Allow Him to speak to you, to restore that hope. Spend time in prayer. Praying, not only for your own circumstances, but praying for others as well. So, spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. And the third thing I would encourage you to do, if you are able, spend time with God's people. Spend time around people that share the same hope that you have. Be encouraged by them. Be challenged.
by them. Again, the point of today's lesson, our hope in Christ strengthens us to stand strong in a broken world. Let me close with prayer and then I'll finish with an announcement before we wrap up this teaching today. Father, we do thank you for the hope and the confidence that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you that that hope allows us to stand strong in this world in which we live. And God, I pray for everyone that is watching this video teaching, whether this is their first uh, time to join or whether they've been a part of this entire unit or from uh, previous weeks. Lord, I pray that you will use your word to give us hope, that you will allow the relationship that we enjoy with you to give us hope, and that you will allow your church, that body of believers, that you will allow that group to give us hope. Thank you, Father, for your spirit who strengthens us, who encourages us. May you be glorified in us and through us. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. So this lesson concludes this unit uh, from the Bible Studies for Life curriculum, which is one of the resources that we use here, uh, especially for our senior adult classes at First Baptist Church in Cameron. And so at the end of this unit in our, in our quarterly, there is a one, a single lesson uh, before it then goes into another unit of six lessons called Why Do I Need the Church? And so uh, what I'm going to do is this. I have a short week this next week because I'm going to take a, a little vacation time with my wife as we celebrate our, uh, celebrate our anniversary next weekend. And so I'm not going to be able to prepare a teaching uh, for this next week. So what I want to challenge you to do is this. Uh, this is the end of a unit, six weeks. Before that, there was another six-week unit that I taught called Dealing with Messy Relationships. And then uh, right before that, uh, the week after Easter is actually when I started doing these video teachings and we started uh, with a lesson called Why the Resurrection Matters. And so next week for you, if you're relying on this video teaching, to be your Bible teaching for the week. What I want you to do is this. I want you to use it as a catch-up weekend. So if you've missed any of those previous, now 13 lessons that I've provided for you, I want you to use next weekend as a week to catch up. And that's going to give me a week away from the responsibility of preparing and teaching this lesson for you so that I can spend the short week that I have in getting some other things in place to be gone for a few days. But then you be ready two weeks from now, which will be uh, the weekend of that Sunday would be the 26th of July. And that weekend we will begin a new unit entitled, Why Do I Need the Church? And so uh, we'll, we will be uh, spending the next six weeks through from July 26th through August 30th in that unit. So again, uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this study together, This not just this one lesson, but these six. And uh, if you are, again, if you are not able to, to go out uh, from your place of, of residence to a church to be a part of a small group study, I encourage you to continue to use these video teachings. If you are able to get out and feel comfortable doing that, I encourage you to find a Bible-believing church where you can go and where you can receive teaching from God's Word, where you can sit in a group with other people and, and discuss God's Word together under the direction and leadership of a teacher. And if you don't have one of those uh, places where you live, uh, but you live here in the Cameron area, I invite you to come and visit us at First Baptist Church in Cameron. Again, I hope that you will have a blessed day and that you again will recognize that your hope in Christ will give you strength to stand strong in this broken world. Be blessed.